Today's presentation is going to be on the history of money, which includes Bitcoin, but it is actually pretty difficult to talk about Bitcoin, uh, why it's so important, why it's a revolutionary technology, without really discussing how money itself is a revolutionary, game-changing technology. So my overall thesis today could be summed up, if you want the too long didn't read ahead of time, as money is an invention, a technology created by human beings to solve a very particular set of problems. And like all technologies, it evolves over time as we find ourselves in situations where we can upgrade its ability to solve those particular sets of problems. So let's go ahead and get started. Talking about the history of money is difficult because money is actually older than history itself. Money predates writing and thus predates recorded history. Hey guys, come on in. We're talking about the history of Bitcoin, history of money. Just grab a seat wherever. We just got started. So we know that money predates writing because you're looking right now at the oldest writing that humanity has discovered. It's an ancient Sumerian tablet that is essentially a very heavy spreadsheet. It's a list of taxes that are owed to the government, bushels of grain, heads of cattle, that sort of thing. So we know that by the time writing and history was established, money was already an integral part of our social fabric. But in order to actually get an idea of how and why money came about, the best that we can do is look at existing societies that live in a very similar fashion to the way our ancient ancestors lived. We can look at various tribes in the Amazonian basin, sub-Saharan Africa, the Australian Aborigines that use the monies that you see here to gain an insight into how and why money might have evolved, how we've gone from beads and shells and feathers to precious metals to paper and now to Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. So in order to get an idea of why money came about, I want you all to imagine that you are in one of these ancient hunter-gatherer societies, that you live in a tribe of people, maybe about 150 individuals, say on the African savanna about 50,000 years ago. Now your life is limited solely to survival. You're just trying to make it one day to the next. And in order to survive, you need a couple of things. Obviously you need food, water, shelter, you need clothing, Tools would be handy, weapons would probably be useful from time to time. And as an individual, you have the option of going out every day and creating or finding or procuring all these different commodities for yourself. You can go hunt your own animals, gather your own plants, build your own tools, create your own weapons. Or you could pick one thing and you could specialize in creating that commodity and you could create a surplus that you can then trade with other people assuming they're doing the same thing. Because as you might all know, biologically we're all individuals. You have a unique set of DNA and that lends to itself the possibility that you might happen to be better at a specific thing than the person sitting next to you. Thanks to uh, sexual recombination, everybody in here is a little bit taller, a little bit shorter, a little bit faster, maybe a little bit better at hunting, maybe a little bit better at weaving pottery, uh, weaving a basket or creating pottery, fishing, whatever it might be. And for the economists in here, that law was formalized a while ago um, by Ricardo and his theory of comparative advantage, that if everybody specializes in something that they have a natural advantage in, well, you can create a surplus than trade. So maybe you're a really good fisher and you're terrible at farming and you're not that great at making clothing or tools or weapons, but man, can you fish? And so maybe you catch 10 fish in a day and you only eat two of them. And then you've got eight to trade with this guy because he's a great hunter. And he goes out, he can't fish for crap, but he can pull down a pretty big antelope once in a while. And so you've got extra fish and you've got extra antelope, and so you guys just make a trade. And that's called bartering. And it works to an extent, but there are some problems with it. Three of the biggest problems associated with a barter economy are as follows. The double coincidence of wants, the pricing issue, and the problem of being able to actually store your value. Money was invented to solve these problems. So very quickly, I'm going to discuss what they are and how money solves them. So in the previous example, I was talking about somebody who had a bunch of extra fish and maybe had a hankering for meat and somebody who happened to have some extra meat and was getting a little tired of it, felt like fish. Well, in a perfect world, 
you happen to want meat at the same time that you happen to want fish and you guys can orchestrate a trade and boom, you're great. But what if you just had fish yesterday and you don't really want any more or you're sick and tired of eating meat and you just don't want to make a trade? In a barter economy, you have to hope that whatever commodity you specialize in, that somebody else happens to want what you have at the same time that you have what they want. And if that doesn't happen, then a trade can't be made. Now, assuming that you've gotten the double coincidence of wants taken care of and that the other person does have what you want at the same time that you want what they have, well, the pricing issue comes into play. Because if there's 150 people in the tribe and all that you have is fish, you have to then figure out the price of fish in terms of meat, in terms of shoes, in terms of tools, in terms of weapons, in terms of shelter. And as you're trying to figure out, well, exactly how many fish should I trade for a pair of shoes, it gets rather dicey. And I won't do the math here, but anyone who's taken basic statistics knows that 150 people each having to memorize 149 other prices that quickly scales into the hundreds of thousands and millions. And it's simply an untenable system. Now, even if you do figure out the double coincidence of wants, and even if you do manage to get around the pricing problem, you're still left with the store of value problem. Because let's say that you did bag a huge antelope and you've got a thousand pounds of meat. And so you eat two or three pounds for the day and maybe you share a whole bunch with your friends and collect a few favors and then you still got 500 pounds of meat left over. Well, maybe you can cure a little bit of it. Maybe if it's really cold, you can dig a hole in the ground and freeze it. But what if in the middle of the night, a bear comes by and he steals your meat? There goes your value. What if you're the guy who procures salt for the tribe so that you can help this guy cure his meat? And then one day the tribe stumbles upon a huge salt mine and there's an infinite amount of salt. Well, the value that you had been storing in that commodity just got inflated away. And if you're the farmer and you decide to store your value in bushels of grain and then the locusts come, well, there goes an entire season's worth of hard work that you tried to store and were unable to do so. So money is a technology that we've invented to solve these problems. Money is a way that we can store value and hold on to it over time. It's a way that we can store value in a form that isn't necessarily dependent upon the one single commodity that we might produce. And over time, people came to realize that there are certain attributes of money, the closer to which you can approximate, the better that money gets. So starting at the top and going clockwise, money should be fungible. You want one dollar bill to be the same as another dollar bill. It should ideally be durable. You don't want it to disintegrate before you're able to use it. It should be portable so you can carry it around. It should be uniform. You want a $1 bill to be worth the same as a $1 coin. It should be limited in the supply. You can't use sand for money if you live at the beach. It should be divisible. So again, if you bag an antelope, you're not trying to figure out how many antelope are worth one pair of shoes. You can cut that sucker down into pieces. And of course, it needs to be acceptable. Games only work if everybody agrees to play the same game. And so over time, over thousands and thousands of years, as various human communities came up with their own types of money, with their beads and their shells and their feathers and their rhinestones, as these tribes interacted and traded, they not only traded goods and services, but they also traded ideas. And they talked to each other about the different kinds of money they were using. And over thousands of years, as a free market for money weeded out the weaker competitors, humanity converged on one commodity gold. For thousands of years, gold was the single standard by which trade was facilitated and commerce brokered. Around the entire world, gold was how you stored value. And if we back up, we can see that gold absolutely nails each one of these monetary ideals. It's quite durable. It's entirely fungible. It's kind of heavy, but it's fairly portable. You can certainly divide it. It's quite uniform and possibly, most importantly, it's scarce. You can't make more gold. You can dig more of it out of the ground, you can filter some of it out of the oceans, but you can't make more of it. Now, as time went on and trade expanded and commerce grew, and the world became much more involved in these sorts of activities, it became rather cumbersome to have to carry around a big sack of gold. Gold is actually rather heavy, as I just mentioned, and it's not exactly the most convenient for running your daily errands. And so at some point, some bright individual came up with the idea of running a bank. And he said, look, here's the deal. You don't want to carry around 30 pounds of gold every time you want to go to the baker and the butcher and the cobbler. 
So why don't you give me your gold, and I'll store it in a vault for a small fee, and instead I'll give you a piece of paper that represents your gold. It's an IOU for the gold. And at any time, you can come back to me and you give me that piece of paper and I'll give you back your gold. And so now you can go to the baker and the butcher and the cobbler and instead of lugging around a heavy sack of metal, you can simply give them these convenient little slips of paper and then they, in turn, can either hold on to them, trade them with other people for other goods or services, or redeem them at the bank for the gold, which always kept the store of value. It wasn't the paper that became valuable. The paper simply represented the value that was stored in the gold. 